So you've heard me talk about detailing and you've seen me nailing walls together, but I know that we went over that kind of quick. And so now that the walls are up, I want to back up and show you what the wall components are and how they're working that I was marking on the plates, you know, several episodes ago while you were watching us come up off the deck and begin to build the walls. Now you may have already, A, either known all about this and this is old news, or B, figured out what I'm talking about when I talk about these various components over the last five or six episodes or however many you've watched, and you may already have this, but maybe not. And so this is just to make sure that we've dotted the I's and crossed the T's concerning what those detail marks meant that I was putting on the plates and that you might have to put on a set of plates someday. So if you remember when I started plating and then detailing the plates, I was working on a deck that had fresh chalk lines representing the wall lines in place. And the plates were laid inside of those wall lines. So the wall lines are fixed. What that means is the first thing I mark on the plates is the intersections of the adjoining walls. Anytime a wall ties into another wall at a 90 degree angle, you have to be able to anchor the wall and provide sheetrock backing. And you usually do that with a channel. This is a channel. Let me show you how that works on the detailing. This is a top plate. It was on the floor. The way you detail for a channel is you mark where the wall intersects and you mark the fact that you need a stud on each side and then if just to make sure there's no confusion I usually put kind of a wide X like that. That is how I detail for a wall channel. With the intersections of the interior walls with the exterior walls then I like to go to windows and doors. Probably doors first but windows and doors openings come next for me. For instance, in this little bathroom, with the walls located with where the channels have to be, I find the center line on the window, and then checking the plans to make sure the window size is right, measure back to locate the window off the center line in the room. Does that make sense? The inside of the rough opening on the window is the inside of the trimmer. You see, the trimmer is a little post. It's holding up the header. And so the inside of that little post defines the width of the rough opening of the window. You've got to verify that, by the way, before you mark these things out. A trimmer always marries up to a king stud. Remember, a stud goes all the way from the bottom plate to the top plate. A trimmer is a post that goes to the bottom of the header married to a king stud that goes from the bottom plate to the top plate, so the whole assembly doesn't want to buckle right here at the bottom of the header. The king stud makes it rigid keeps the trimmer in place and the trimmer holds up the header. If you know the depth of your header, then you know the length of your cripples. This is a top cripple. I don't know exactly why it's called a cripple. Per perhaps that's not politically correct, but that's a top cripple. And these from the bottom sill, this is a sill, down to the bottom plate, that's the plate, are a bottom cripple. Typically they're going to match because they're going to be on the same common 16 inch stud layout as the rest of the wall. They just happen to be shortened by the opening. In this house, on this wall, the stud layout is 16 inches on center. Sometimes 24 inches is acceptable, but not in this one. And so the common stud layout is 16 inches. But keep in mind that with the walls that interrupt the layout, that doesn't mean that every stud is gonna be 16 inches from an interior wall. It just means that on the outside of the building, there will be a stud every 16 inches. That's handy on your sheeting on the outside. There are special conditions. For instance, right here I came to a break in the plate. I don't remember why it seemed more reasonable to me to throw in two studs than to shorten the plate to the 16 inch center and cut it. So I threw in a couple of studs. I like wood. I don't mind using it. And at the time that was a thing to do. Here's a special condition. I needed a post under a beam. Instead of putting a six by six in here, I tripled up two by sixes. Works great. Centered the beam on there. It is well supported. In a detailing situation, this would just be three X's side by side on the plate. And when I'm throwing the studs in, I would know, okay, I don't need, or whoever's throwing the studs in doesn't have to even know it's a post because they'll know that three studs go right there. This is a non-typical condition. This is sort of a wall channel for a post in a beam pocket. But I don't think I detailed this when I built this wall. I think I needed to wait until the porch roof, it was time to frame the porch roof on the other side, 
because this is the end of the ridge beam on the covered patio in the back. And until I had the rafter patterns cut and can verify exactly where this was going to happen, I saved this for later. By the way, this is not done. When we do the pickup and the final tuning on this wall, I'm going to put another 2x6 in here underneath where those shims are thick so that there is really great bearing all the way across there. And because this is, holding, this is holding something, right? And this needs to be well supported. This wall, and really the one on the other end, these gable end rake walls, are about as, there's about as much detail in these little walls as you're gonna find in walls no bigger than this. I mean, as I look at this, I think, okay, this wall is receiving five beams, four corbels, one wall channel, two outside corners. You've got fire blocking in two different planes. You've got a shear panel happening over here. There's just a lot of detail here. There was so much detail that it could not be put on the bottom plate and the top plate because the top plate was raked. So a separate layout plate pole, story pole, had to be detailed to be able to transfer all the details that are happening in this wall onto the floor so that it could be built flat, raised up, and have some chance of having these components in the right place. So I know you've already seen the video of this being built, right? And you saw the full-size template that we snapped out on the deck, but I haven't seen that video yet, okay? I'm, this, in the sequence of filming and creating this stuff, it gets a little bit like a Twilight Zone experience. So I don't know if what I'm telling you about this wall now is redundant or not, but you know, I mean, you can always skip forward if you have to because there's new information coming a little later in this video. This wall was a head scratcher. This is a California corner. It's indicated with two X's, a short X and a long X. And the orientation of the corner depends on which way the intersecting wall is coming from. The advantage to a California corner is it only takes two boards. You're only handling two boards, you're only buying two boards, you're only nailing together two boards. And you get the drywall backing on the outside, on this side, and on the inside of the intersecting wall. They're pretty slick. There is another older way to make a corner also. You might remember I had Daniel prefabbing a lot of these, uh, what now, at the beginning, weeks ago, at the beginning of the framing process, I put him to work building a certain number of California corners and a certain number of wall channels. The beauty of a wall channel or a California corner is they're automatically right or left. They're used everywhere. They show up. You're always glad to have one close to hand and you don't have to stop and build it at that moment. There's a couple things you have to keep track of when you're nailing them together. They need to be flush on this side. I mean, all the way from the top to the bottom, they need to be flush and the ends need to be exactly flush. If you're sloppy in either of those, they're pretty much worthless. I'm downstairs now because this is a good example of another type of corner. This is called a corner, okay? This is an old, older, a more original way to make a corner in um, West Coast framing process. Three studs, or you can use blocks. You just need a stud, an inch and a half space, and a stud. So you get a chance to get rid of some short material and you get a nice stout corner that's hard for an electrician to drill through. Okay, and it can't be filled with insulation. And so there are some reasons that this has been largely replaced by California corners. But the advantage in this case is it took up a little less space so I could crowd this door opening over just a little tighter to this side. So to wrap this up, there's a world of information you can put on a set of plates, a set of wall plates. And after all the special conditions are put in, you put the common layout in whether it's two foot or, or 16 inch. You hold back so your four foot sheet goods break in the middle of the stud and you just mark them. But the takeaway is, however much special information you have to put on that set of plates, stud heights, you know, clip the plate to drop stud height or wh whatever it is, it all has to be right because it'll take a moment to make the mark and hours to tear out the lumber if you get it in the wrong spot. So set up a situation where you can get it right. Thanks for watching Essential Craftsman and keep up the good work.